whole family lives pretty far away, so I've taken a lot of commercial flights. However, I've come to realize that I never fully appreciated flight and all the complexities that the earliest pilots had to deal with. I've had a closer relationship with flying than most people. My first experience behind the wheel of a car actually came after my first experience behind the yoke of an airplane. That experience came when I was 14, when my dad took me on a cross-country flight in a Cessna 182, which is a four-seat plane. This was my first experience flying in a plane that wasn't a commercial jet of considerable size, so I was a bit nervous. For years, it was my dad's dream to be able to fly himself and our family to visit his family in New Jersey. He dreamed of being able to just up and go whenever he wanted with no planning. So when he offered to take me on a cross-country flight, I thought it was a great idea. He said that it would be about the same time to go door to door as a commercial flight, and under the right circumstances, he's right. However, as I learned on that flight, there were many reasons why this isn't always the case. On that flight, I faced some of the problems that faced the earliest pilots. You see, being in a commercial plane really abstracts away all the nitty gritty stuff that shows the ingenuity needed to make planes fly. There are only really a few problems you need to solve in order to fly. The Wright brothers identified three problems that if they solved them, they'd be able to fly. The first one is they needed a set of lifting surfaces, or wings. The second one was a propulsion method, or an engine. And the third one was a method of controlling and balancing the aircraft. By exploring these fundamental facets of flight, we can gain a better appreciation for just how amazing it is that we can fly at all. So the first problem, wings. Before you can even think about flying anything, even a glider, you have to think about lift. The actual mechanism behind flight was understood back in 1738 when Daniel Bernoulli reasoned that pressure decreases when the flow rate increases. In theory, this means that if you make air fly faster over the top of a wing, its pressure will be lower than the air pressure below the wing. The air below pushes harder and the wing experiences an upward force, in theory. In practice, it's difficult to achieve the necessary lift to actually do anything productive, and it's made more difficult by the fact that the optimal wing shape for lift depends on a number of factors, which means it's difficult to design a wing that's suitable for all phases of flight. As a pilot, you have some control over the shape of the wing. Using the flaps, you can generate additional lift by increasing the curvature of the wing from this, where the wings are flat, to this, where they're bent. This is helpful when taking off. The downside is increased drag the eternal enemy of the pilot, which is why during normal flight, they're retracted. Somewhat paradoxically, when you're landing, you actually want that extra drag because it'll help you to slow down the land. When the Wright brothers were building their first plane, they tried to imitate previous wing designs, but they found them to be much worse than they expected. The lift they measured was a paltry one-third of the lift they needed, based on the data they looked at, and they were using the best known wings at the time. The plane that I flew cross-country in, as well as most planes flying today, had their wings designed essentially by trial and error. Wings are still tested by placing them in a wing tunnel like this one and repeatedly tweaking them until they produce the optimal lift for a particular size. Only very recently did computer simulations make a large impact on the wing design process. Now on to the second problem, the engine. In 1892, before anyone had flown a powered aircraft before, a man named Hiram Maxim said, Give us an appropriate engine, and we will very soon give you a successful flying machine. However, an engine that is appropriate for flying is probably the most difficult problem to solve from an engineering perspective because of the specifications that engine has to meet. It has to be both light and powerful, and it has to solve the problem that most of us struggle with in the morning, which is the need to haul its own weight around. The original Red Flyer was about 30% engine by weight. To save weight, it was designed with a bicycle chain and without modern features like a throttle, spark plugs, or a fuel pump. That meant once you started it with a spark from batteries, it ran at full power until you stopped it. Good luck landing a plane with those considerations in mind. Nowadays, or after 30 years, plane engines began to look more like this engine from a reproduction Waco biplane, although the engine in this plane is original. It has a radial arrangement of pistons and a generally more refined design, and it produces approximately 40 times more power than the Wright Brothers' original engine despite being only two and a half times as heavy. Despite all the improvements in performance, plane engines still don't have gearboxes, and some, like the plane I was flying in, have their engines without fuel pumps. All plane engines are still so loud that without proper soundproofing, you need to wear ear protection in order to not lose your sense of hearing. So now we're on to the, last, the third and last problem, control. After my dad learned to fly, 
My mom decided that she should too, or at the very least learn how to land the plane in an emergency. Perhaps she didn't like the feeling, uh, the lack of control she felt sitting in the co-pilot seat not knowing how to fly, but needless to say, she got her license two years ago. Now I'm the third person in my family to learn how to fly, and I have some experience with actual flying. And let me tell you, although the control problem is solved in the sense that a pilot can control their plane, that doesn't mean it's easy. The Wright brothers controlled their plane with a rudder and wing warping. Wing warping is where you take the trailing edges of the wings and move them oppositely, one up and one down. This is like a paper airplane where you might bend the trailing edge of the wing upwards or downwards in order to cause it to fly in a spiral. Besides this, the original Wright Flyer only had one other control system, and that was an elevator to climb or descent. Modern airplanes have many more control systems, which simultaneously make it easier for a pilot to control their plane, but also more challenging for a beginner pilot to learn how to fly. The best analogy to learning to fly is like driving a car. When you're driving a car, you really only have two things to worry about. You have your speed and your direction. In a plane, out of the dozen or so things you have to maintain, you have to be actively balancing four of them in order to perform those maneuvers. To show just how complicated it can be, here's the inside of the plane that I was flying in. Here I'm going to label some of the things that you have to be looking out for. So you have your attitude indicator, you have your heading indicator, you have your airspeed indicator, you have your VORs, you have your turn coordinator, trim tab, altimeter, vertical speed indicator, avionics, throttle, engine RPM, mixture, and your master switch. Now as you can see, the transition from driving a car to flying a plane can be a bit intense, and it definitely takes a bit of practice to be able to perform those maneuvers. Take for example, performing a coordinated turn, which is a turn without any side slip. First you have to tilt the plane and use the, using the ailerons, and then use the rudder to make sure that you don't move adversely in the yaw direction. You also have to maintain your speed and your altitude, which would both drop on their own normally. And you also have to maintain the proper angle of turn that you want to hold. In order to get my private pilot's license, I'll be expected to perform a 30 degree coordinated turn. I'll be graded on my ability to main a maintain airspeed and altitude while also maintaining our situational awareness outside of the plane in order to exit the turn at the same heading I entered the turn at. Now, I lied. There really are four problems. The fourth problem is weather. And although it's not one of the three problems that the Wright brothers identified as needing to be solved in order to fly at all, it's the biggest remaining problem for pilots today. As shown in this chart, weather is responsible for the lion's share of delays in commercial flights. And it's responsible for even more problems in small aircraft. Despite all the improvements in, te in technology we've made over the last hundred years, that we still can't do much to beat the weather. We can de-ice our planes in the winter, and we can fly around localized thunderstorms, but mostly there is nothing to do but wait. On that very same cross-country flight that I talked about earlier, we had to navigate around a wall of thunderstorms that was about 150 miles across and 40,000 feet tall. This is already a challenge, but it was especially so because my dad had just gotten his instrument rating, and our plane that we were flying in was not equipped with in-flight weather. We ended up threading the needle through thunderstorms flying about 100 miles off of our intended course to get to a place where the clouds looked like this, where you can see a hole instead of this, where they make a solid wall and you can't really get around. It felt a little hairy when we were flying, but with the help of air traffic control, we managed to safely get to our destination, albeit more than an hour later than we were supposed to. One of the biggest challenges with learning to fly in the Midwest is that the weather is seldom perfect. We have to be able to deal with heat and cold, rain and ice, and the Midwest really knows how to have a thunderstorm. I suspect that I'll be able to fly only about half the times that I'm supposed to. Now, moving back to the Wright brothers and the earliest pioneers of flight, it's really amazing to think just how many problems they solved. They solved all the problems preventing powered flight in a mere four years. And in that time, they went from just beginning to think about the problems of flying to having a fully powered aircraft fly on its own for 12 seconds. Only 33 years after that, Airlines were flying DC-3s, which looked much like modern jets, in cross-country routes. Now that's an impressive problem to solve. Thank you.